Yeah. Live right now. And it's just on our page, right? Yes. So if I post our page. Oh, interesting. There we go. What? What'd you what say? Are you watching on Facebook? No, there's a, on the, one of the corners there, it says live, recorded live on Facebook. This is an OK Zoomer moment, and welcome to the world, Facebook. OK, we okay. are. Yeah. They're watching? On. Yeah. OK, well, welcome, everyone, uh, to this, our Facebook Live slash Zoom slash virtual uh, gathering. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the first of what we'll be trying at the Indigenous Screen Office um, to gather together and uh, discuss with uh, folks. And I'm very pleased that we're joined today by two uh, great filmmakers who have movies that you should be watching. Uh, after you watch this, you should go watch their uh, uh, movies. So I'm pleased to be joined by Marie Clements from the West Coast and Shane Belcourt here from the East Coast. Hi guys. Hey, morning. Hello, Jesse, Facebook. So Hello. first, um, so they're prepared. Where, I uh, will start with you, Marie, but where can they find your movie? once they're done watching us do this thing? Uh, we go uh, on iTunes tomorrow. So May 15th on iTunes, you'll see Red Snow. Yeah. Shane? Um, yeah, so Red Rover is playing right now in Canada on iTunes or Apple TV, whatever your ISO update is giving you. Um, it's also on Google Play, uh, Vimeo On Demand, Bell VOD and Shaw. VOD. And then in the States, it's playing on a lot of the same stuff. So Apple TV, iTunes, Google Pay, Amazon Video, Video, Vimeo VOD, Direct TV, and In Demand. So wow. it's online. It's v the VOD stuff. It's uh, out there in the web. <laughs> so basically, wherever you... And if you email me, I'll give you a free link. No, I won't. <laughs> <laughs> That's... That's not how you do this business. <laughs> so, um, well, that's all uh, very exciting. Um, now, Marie, I know with you, Red Snow was meant to come out um, in the theaters, I think on March 13th, which of course is the day, uh, at least here in Toronto and many other places that the world's sort of closed uh, for a bit. Um, so I, I don't know in the end how that theatrical, did you even end up running in the theaters or how did that end up working for you? And how did you get to now where you're releasing it on uh, iTunes? Uh, yeah, definitely. We uh, opened in theaters across Canada on uh, Friday, March 13th, which um, you're right, was kind of the ground zero of everything starting to shut down. Uh, so yeah, I was in Vancouver and we went uh, with some members of the cast, but um, was a bit nervous because um, I, I think there was a, t a couple of days before where it was, you know, people were talking about it and things were ramping up, ramping up. And then suddenly, you know, Friday morning, it was like, I don't know if I feel comfortable asking my cast to come, um, the other producers, that kind of thing. So uh, I ended up going just in case someone showed up, to be honest. Um, but they, it really was like a ghost town. Um, I think uh, when we got there, there maybe was 12 people in the entire bu building uh, in Cineplex, you know, in Vancouver. Uh, and we had this hearty, you know, maybe 10 people that showed up. So it was very surreal, but, um, you know, in some ways, uh, we had, I don't know, it's not something you ever expect. So there's no way to really act, but kind of go, you're going to be there and be present. And uh, we were just monitoring it. And, you know, also just really careful to kind of go, you as a filmmaker, of course, you want, you know, hundreds of people to come sit in seats and see your film. But I was also very nervous because I, you know, this is new for me too. It's a new pandemic. And uh, nobody really knew the ex what was going to happen. Yeah. Hmm. And was is this the sort of scheduled uh, iTunes release? Because you know, usually for folks who don't know, in the when a movie comes out in the theaters, there's what we call a theatrical window where it only plays in theaters, and then it opens into uh, say your iTunes or your VOD or your 
TV or, or so on. Was this always the planned uh, window or have you moved that up because of the pandemic? Yeah, we moved it up and there was a lot of back and forth. I'm sure like yourself and um, Shane and everybody that was releasing at this time, people weren't sure if this would be like, you know, two or three weeks or, you know, is this going to be a couple months or are we really looking that uh, we lost our window, you know, in some ways because uh, no, but I don't think everybody knows that still and everything's still shut down. So this was what, you know, we were going back and forth with the distributor and all the, all the stakeholders and going, you know, what's the best way that we can present the film uh, and still have people see it and appreciate it um, in this new kind of paradigm. Yeah. And for you, Shane, I, there was a theatrical, I think, planned for uh, Red Rover that obviously uh, isn't happening, at least not in, in theaters, the traditional theatrical. <laughs> so uh, talk, walk us through a bit the decision making around around that and how the experience of shifting from a from a theatrical for what is admittedly a, a small budget production to this online uh, debut. Yeah, so um, we uh, one thing that I do miss about the theatrical um, experience, which we had planned for the end of March, a small like certain pockets of theaters, uh, the distributor. Um, uh, Indy Can and Abby Fittergreen had planned in some spots across Canada. Um, and it was, you know, the, from past experience uh, with Tecorano going to theaters and some places in Canada, it was, you know, there's a lot of nerve wracking things, but it also kind of, you feel like there's this momentum leading in from the press reviews and everyone's kind of galvanized around, you know, newspapers come out on Thursday and Friday, movies premiere on Friday, this kind of thing. I grew up with this routine of of how it goes in the first weekend. You could check the box office, which is also sometimes terrible news to check the box office. But it's it, it, not that it's like a Star Wars movie, but you, it's sort of interesting to see how it's playing in different towns and, and what screenings at what times. And and uh, so, you, you know, there's that in the mind of, oh, Red Rover will enjoy that release as well. Uh, and then so to, you know, similar to what Marie's speaking about, the idea of, you know, COVID and all the rest of it sort of taking over and changing. Uh, that was immediately canceled. Like that was obvious right away that, that this is not gonna happen. Um, and uh, the distributor was able to quickly transition into the online platform release, which was already like wheels turning. Um, the, 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 for me, the big drag of it is uh, in a theatrical setting, people don't, they can't leave. So in, a, in an online setting, people can hit stop. So I'm worried about those things. I don't want to hear the returns of people only watching five minutes <laughs> that heading now or being distracted, Jesse. You know, maybe they're watching the movie right now as this FaceTime thing's going on. You know, these are the kind of things that I, you know, in a theater, I can at least guarantee that no one's doing that, hopefully. <laughs> so uh, no, but it's, it's, it, it, it's weird because then it has this other similar style kind of uh, routine, you know, where because I'd seen other films previously, um, most notably Blood Quantum by Jeff Barnaby, where, you know, obviously outstanding film, everybody has to see it, it's amazing, he's a genius. Okay, but now that, with that, you saw that in other Canadian films, Nose to Tail, there's a whole bunch of them where they're coming out on, uh, online. So now it's like, oh, as opposed to the Thursday, Friday media, suddenly it's you, what's happening on Monday? Because it's going online mm. on Tuesday for most of these uh, releases, this big kind of like, almost like new music and new uh, on-demand things on Tuesday, and so that was you kind of go, oh, there's a routine here that's similar, and the press is similar. Everyone's kind of responding the same way, um, where you you're trying to do the galvanize people to know about your film. Um, you would do the same things on you know Twitter and other social media platforms, and and the only thing that's really missing is the chance to sort of be there in a room with the people uh, enable them, I mean, you know, to laugh. But I mean, as a, I grew up renting VHSs and um, watching classics by myself. So in a way it's kind of like, it's normal, but it's not normal. Yeah, it, would, it struck me that when Blood Quantum came out, uh, I did a, a Q and A on one, similar to what we're doing. I did one of these with Jeff on like the, the Wednesday of the release. And it was for, I think for, for me anyway, I hope for Jeff, it was the exact same conversation that we were gonna have, but it was supposed to be in front of a live audience. Uh, and, and yet here we were doing it. And I, 
it felt the same, but not the same. And so I, I understand, although I will say, uh, I remember renting uh, Betamax, uh, Shane, and it was absolutely the superior uh, format. <laughs> Couldn't afford it. You, 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 you're you on a different circle than me, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was the big splurge in the Wendy household <laughs> when my dad came home with the color, the Sony Betamax machine. It was, uh, uh, he was always putting, betting on the, 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 the one that would eventually go out of business immediately. <laughs> Not only was it better quality, Jesse, as a, I remember there was two colored tags and the movie you wanted to see, all the VHS tags were gone, but there was always a supply of the uppity Betamax <laughs> crowd could get whatever was new. You win twice. That's so. right. <laughs> um, so what is the, what has it been like? Like you said, the press is the same, the sort of the rhythms are a bit uh, the same. I know both of you had been doing the festival circuit sort of last fall uh, leading up to the, the theatrical. Um, do, you, do you feel that the movie, like do you have concerns that the movie won't be as seen as much or do, are you, like how do you feel about the, the nature of the releases and how people are gonna be able to watch the, the movies? Murray, maybe let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably like Shane, we had a, you know, a really great festival run and we were racing with that um, this winter coming into the release. Uh, so that was all, you know, really um, had a momentum and an energy, energy and the press was kind of flowing with that, which was great. So a little bit, we kind of, you know, the fault start uh, kind of, it just kind of stopped. And then of course, you know, revamping or re-energizing going, well, you know, how can we uh, get Red Snow out there? Um, we've kind of done the festival run. We did a lot of the reviews. So just, you know, having a really great PR, um, uh, Pender PR and A71 kind of coming on board to really kind of go, okay, we need to get another, um, another energy, another wave of it uh, for this release. So I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I know that, you know, there's such a great uh, feeling when you're a filmmaker and you're presenting your film live, you know, it's scary and all those things we love, but there's also that connection with an audience, right? Um, and I, you know, I've been, you know, we've all been home for weeks now, but I mean, I'm absorbing, you know, any and all, uh, all kinds of films, all kinds of TV, all kinds of series. Um, and I have a little bit more time, you know, even if I'm working longer, I seem, you know, your time is, you have a little bit more windows. Hmm. So I'm hoping, you know, people are just like me, we're looking to absorb story, um, like we're just eating it up. And I'm hoping that will include Red Snow for audiences. Hmm. Shane? Um, so our, our, release strategy, I think that's a good word to lie, to fit into her as a liar, strategy, um, is uh, had a lot to do with, we had a $50,000 production. So the film, um, you know, was, I know it was spent really in production, not really any money for post, just a little bit in post. So when we did our theatrical, it was in stereo. Um, there was uh, some sound mixing issues. Uh, there was no, we would never pass any kind of QC, anything to get released, you know, and so we wouldn't qualify for anything other than somebody sending, sending a Vimeo link, which was very thrilling at the time. And so when the distributor came on, one of the, the great things about working with Avi and his company and his team um, was sort of redoing all the post, you know, um, you know, fine tuning the image and, uh, getting the sound uh, just just so uh, from a, a wonderful sound mixer, George, in Toronto here. And so we, we, did, we did all those things. And so that took a lot of time um, to sort of redo the post and then, uh, you know, the, redo the poster, redo everything. Um, and then we were finally ready to sort of, okay, well now we're gonna release this. Uh, and then it was, well, when's the right window? And so then, you know, so looking ahead, Avi was like, okay, well, you know, I project that the spring's a good time. And so well, we'll, we're done in December. Let's just get this over with. Duane and I, the co-writer and uh, my, you know, my closest friend, uh, we were, we kind of just felt we wanted to get the pain of it over with as quickly as possible. <laughs> like just get it out there, let people say whatever they're going to say, and then we'll feel shame and then we'll move on. Uh, hopefully it'll be less uh, jarring than that. Uh, and uh, and so it was when we got the release, like, okay, here's the date, here's it, you know, that was, that was now we're, 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 it's this weird feeling where it's, 
it's it's kind of like for for myself it's the end and I, my brain can finally like let go of it and let the balloons fly off into uh, and pollute the atmosphere i guess is my analogy here um but you know like the blue balloons fly off where i can now kind of move on to other projects like really fulsomely like i i have a hard time mm -hmm my mind's kind of like, oh yeah, what are we doing? What are we doing? How's that going to go? And oh, there's another movie out that's kind of, you know, coming along these same, I hope ours gets out, you know, all those kind of worries and, and natterings you have in your mind and anxieties. So to have it released and to know that people are watching it and uh, that it's out there is, is a relief and it's exciting. And um, it's different as, you know, Marie mentioned, you know, to have something kind of out there in a place where it's only alone <laughs> you know like mm -hmm. the box office you'd have a, you'd have a return as i was saying you'd know how many people watched it and it's sort of like i was asking us to read the day like when do we find out how many people downloaded it or rented it and you know uh Dwayne piped in you don't want to know shane and i was like thanks man <laughs> uh and then uh, <laughs> and then that was followed up by what well, we'll you know, we won't know till the middle of the summer, maybe the end of the summer. That's when some of these things report. So not that I'm trying to base it on those kind of returns, but I'm just curious, you know, like, so we'll just have to hope for the best and keep following Twitter, which is a different experience for me. Uh, I'm wondering um, uh, for both of you, I, I, it's interesting to, to, for that these films come at this time uh, the, there was this cluster along with Blood Quantum sort of in this moment. And one of the things I love about it is that these are films that are really expanding the idea of what an indigenous movie is or can be. Uh, you know, you two have made movies that are very, very different on the, really on the totally different end of the spectrum, but also not the type of movies that we've traditionally seen get called indigenous cinema. Um, and so I'm wondering, um, you know, A, what you guys think, I guess, really, about um, what is happening right now in our community, in the sector, in terms of the types of stories that we're now being able to tell. And again, both your films made on very different scales too, right? Shane's a very small budget um, a movie. Marie's not a, not a huge budget, but certainly much bigger scope sort of scale uh, film. So I'm just interested on in what you see, how our, our community is shifting in this moment and what's, what's happening with um, this entire sort of community we have. Well, um, I'll just, yeah, I, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited that people, filmmakers are able to, um, to execute their vision. And I love that um, as individual artists and people that come from different places and different nations and different ideas of the world, that, that we're seeing those visions um, are very specific and very unique to each other. And uh, I mean, I think we all have something in common, obviously, but I love that they're just so different. And I, I think maybe that takes a lot of people by surprise. And I kind of love that. I love that it's shocking. And, um, and it's explosive and it has energy and we're feeding off each other, you know? I love that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's that kind of um, the trope of, of, of uniformed singular indigenous experience, even in, you know, the nation state of Canada. You know, like, oh, you know, everybody does uh, smudging with sweet grass and whatever the, you know, the thing might be that we kind of want to whittle it down to is a singular thing. And then everyone's coming from their own, uh, their own nations, their own places, uh, their own backgrounds, their own personal. And then you add film genre into it. Like, you know, everybody has a certain tone, a style, a thing that they're into, uh, you know, um, and it's impossible for it not to have a bit of politics you know, or the feeling of the of these politics coming in just because the perspective is different uh, or unique or um, singular. And, and that's, that's one of the great things about it. That's, I think, the, the cohesiveness of it is, is uh, these are stories that are often left not on screen. So now they are becoming on screen, which is an exciting time. Um, and uh, I, I, just to echo what Marie was saying, it, it is really, really thrilling 
to see all the different variations of story from indigenous storytellers um, on all the different uh, platforms, whether it's novels and, and uh, biographies, uh, documentaries, and now fiction film as we're sort of ramping up more productions in the narrative side of things with bigger budgets. And uh, we know that Nyla has her slashback film coming out. Uh, that's a well-financed horror extravaganza. And I've read the script. It's unbelievably exciting. I can't wait to see that one. I can't wait to see Dennis's film when it's all the posts is all put together. Another super exciting film, uh, sci-fi. Uh, and then we have uh, Zoe Hopkins, another romantic. She, her and I are like romantic comedies. You know, we're into that world a lot. And so, you know, just two sci-fi. Here's two romantic comedies. You have Marie's genius of multi-protagonist, multi-perspective, uh, real life. Um, I don't know, I, it's just the drama of it is so visceral and intense and it feels like you're almost watching the news at the same time as watching a film and that's the genius of Marie's writing from theater to, to cinema. Like there's just so many different kinds of ways of expressing our stories, our genres, but at the end of the day, we're getting our characters and our worldview or our, you know, not, it's not teachings. We're not like, hey, sit down, let me tell you something, you know, but it's sort of the, something that you experience by the end, you're like, that felt, a slice that was new, a slice that's original, that something that's not usually seen on on screen, and and uh, and that's ultimately that's you know I, I mean it just seems like this thing's going, and the audience is going to keep growing. I mean you know, and that, that's just in this sort of Canadian context, let alone hmm. you know world Indigenous cinema, New Zealand, Australia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It feels like you know I think one of the challenges always when talking about Indigenous cinema. I think globally, but even if we just stick specifically to Canada, has always been that because of the system of how movies get made in Canada, the in what Indigenous cinema is, a part of it is always a function of what movies we're allowed to make, that that we can get financed or get approved by the system, a system that of course isn't really ours or our our construction. And I would argue has been, has limited the idea of what an indigenous movie can be. And it feels like we're finally at the moment where that is all going away. Although I should say, it does feel like that's happening on the movie side. And it's been much slower to happen, say on the seri serialized TV side of things where the investment can sometimes be even bigger uh, for a production company than on a single film. And as a sector, you know, the investment of the sector is bigger into a series than it is on a, a one-off film. So it still feels like we need the TV side to move, but it feels like on the movie side, you, you, we could make anything and that, and that we're not, there's less of those restrictions than before. And I'm wondering if you folks feel the same way in your own practice that like there's what you could imagine going to a funder for is 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 it different now than it was a few years ago? Well, I think we've always had the vision and and talent in our you know in our with our, our filmmakers and, and storytellers. I do feel that the that the um, that glass ceiling's got a few chips in it now, you know, and I do feel that. That, that you know, I was going to say they should be scared. No, I'm just saying that they shouldn't be scared. But that you know, once you let something open, you know, it's going to be this floodgate. Because I think you're right. There's a there's been a parking lot of stories that have been held back be, because we could, they couldn't afford them or we couldn't afford to make mm. them. Um, so I think that's starting to break down, and we're seeing it as you know we're witnessing that as uh, in our time here, which is I think what gives us hope for the next ones we're trying to get going, but um, I don't know. I, I think it's, 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 it's um, the first time I think I've felt in the last three years where anything is possible. And that, you know, mm. the fight to live up to your vision, the live up to your story, just a little bit closer, you know, you can feel it and you can taste it, which is, mm. you know, that's been a hard journey some days, you know, when you're so far away from executing a vision um, that will take uh, a lot of the stakeholders to come into play. And I think that's what we're seeing is that people are coming to, uh, coming to the table and that things are actually green, getting green lit through different stages. And that to me is you know, extraordinarily um, 
exciting because as we know, it just doesn't take me saying, oh, I want to do this movie. It takes a room, you know, it takes a few, a few rooms to make that possible. You have to get a lot of nods uh, before you can even, you know, uh, get in a room with, uh, with the creative. So um, I, I do think it's a very heady time and I think um, uh, things will keep maturing in that. And I think it will get better at getting what we deserve. That makes sense, but there you go. Yeah. Yeah. How about um, you, Shane? I mean, I mean, you you've know, always been a very independent sort of uh, artist. Well, what about for you? Um, I think replace independent with impatient, and you're more uh, you're more acutely <laughs> defining uh, what I'm doing with whatever this is I'm doing. Um, it's it, it, it. I had other projects that I wanted to get financed, the things that we wanted to work through telefilm and what have you. Um, and in a lot of those instances before, um, there was sometimes a pressure of, if you want something that's more genre-ish, uh, less personal, you know, my story, my experience, a smaller budget, something a bit bigger, um, you know, the one of the holdbacks, you know, you'd have when you have meetings was sort of like, well, who's in it? you know, because my expenditure and investment has to be returned. And the easiest equation of that is famous people in movies equates to getting in returns. And as we all know, it's sort of, you know, you listen to how many movie podcasts and movie uh, pundits talking about the star structure. It's basically evaporated. Yes, there's a few and there are Marvel movies and then that's it. So we don't really have those kind of movie stars to rely on or to have the pressure to rely on, you know, other things are starting to replete, you know, and there's also uh, the ongoing hunger as multiplexes are converging on the, only a few titles. The audience is left thirsty for a whole bunch of other wider titles, and that, which is always fulfilled by the mid budget and lower budget Hollywood movies. Mm -hmm. They don't make them anymore. So now there's this window for other stories to come out. And there's only too many examples for every, uh, you know, group of people who are told that, oh, no one cares about your story those stories and those characters are unrelatable. Uh, and that's just not the case. And there's too many examples and so too many proofs of concepts of that thing. So now I, I find that, you know, you walk in and you say, no, I have this great idea. It's about the idea, which feels equal to what you'd, I would assume other people who are saying, oh, I have this film that's about everybody, basically and anybody who's like white stars. And this is something I'm coming in with something that's a, it's set with a, an indigenous uh, community or a character world or the goal. And all these things are related to sort of um, these, you know, I, I'm thinking about a bigger budget um, comedy heist film that I'm working on right now. And nobody questioned who's in it. That was never a conversation with any of the people mm. who've expressed interest in the film. It was, Oh, that's a great idea. Oh, that fills a place. Oh, it's Métis specific characters. And there's suddenly like, you know, things were people going, I'm excited about that world and, the, and these, this idea. Uh, and, and, you know, proofs in the pudding, the script and all those other things that come. But it, it wasn't so much that earlier question, which I remember being a younger person trying to get things going that, so that's why I rushed to do low budget, no budget films. Cause I could just do it. Nobody would say anything. Um, and then now you're seeing with so many examples that no, if it's a good idea from a you know a talented writer and director and they can back that up with a vision, um, you know, we have so many examples of this, then people will invest in it based on the fact that it's a great movie. And you can't say that, oh, unless there's a famous white star, no one's gonna watch this movie. Yes, mm. we know that if you're gonna talk a hundred million dollars, maybe that's a pertinent conversation. But you know, when you're talking the Canadian big budget film, 1.2 to 10 that's not a conversation point to, to withhold the investment to the excitement. If it's a great idea, you know, it can catch a cultural zeitgeist moment and then you're off to the races. Everybody is. I wonder what this moment will mean even to that dynamic, because it, it strikes me that, um, you know, I, I'm interested in how both of you are imagining I'm interested in a couple of things, what you're both work currently working on, but also how you imagine going forward with the, with the virus, with the pandemic. Um, you know, I think in our industry, uh, I think there's a couple of expectations. One, that we may be among the last industries to sort of go back to, I, 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 I don't, wouldn't want to say normal, 
but go back to work uh, anyway, um, even though there's an undeniable demand for what this industry produces at this current moment, an enormous demand and an enormous opportunity because there's so many people watching uh, that I think the opportunity for films of all size to break through is actually quite uh, is right here right now because you do have um, some people albeit not undivided attention but a lot more people paying attention so I'm I'm into you know Marvel movies and those blockbusters that filled those multiplexes it strikes me that scale in this current moment is actually the exact wrong thing to have had half because the larger you are the harder it is going to be able to go back to some semblance of normal, whether you're a movie theater that has to manage 14 screens versus one screen or two screens, or you're a production that has needs 160 people on set every day for, for 60 straight days, that's tough. That's going to be tough. <clears throat> Yet smaller, might act more nimble, might actually be exactly what this moment not maybe not even needs or but allows um so i'm wondering how so first of all what what are you both working on in this moment and and then how are you imagining what this moment will influence how you work going forward and what you do when we begin to come out of this uh well i'm i'm working on a uh two or three tv uh series and um, most uh, prominently right now is a series called uh, Bones of Crows. It's a four part mini series. Um, and I'm, I'm taking it, you know, I think uh, we're built to move as fast as we can because we want to be ready. Uh, we want to be ready when we get the green light. We want to be ready to shoot. Uh, so there's been this breath in that creation process, which, you know, it's not a, it's not a terrible thing given what's happening in the world. Uh, but obviously, a lot of us that uh, write our own work and, and produce our own work to some extent, uh, there's a lot of that you can do, um, you know, on a small island or in your home or in your room. So I think that's one thing that's, you know, I've been um, just in my writing room, which is uh, uh, that way anyways. It's a self-isolating self room anyways. But I think as far as industry, what's happening in the industry and people talking, I mean, I think what I'm hearing that changes a bit weekly and, and the how of it and the when of it, nobody knows. And, you know, are they going to get a vaccine? Are we going to be able to be all and be in the same room together, breathing down each other's back, which we do when we're shooting, we're right in each other's faces, we're close by each other. Um, are we going to be able to do that in a year or six months? You know, I, I don't know. But I know people that are wanting to ramp up and, and shoot because they're waiting. Um, they're looking at all the, the safety measures uh, and looking at that, that very idea of scaling back. You know, who do we really, what do we really need uh, for this scene? What do we really need uh, for this movie, for it to be told in this new way? Um, so I think that's ever, that's gonna be ever changing, but certainly we know for sure that nothing is going to go to screen. You know, nothing's going to go to what uh, to set until you know everyone's safe and everything's been um, put together. But it is a very strange time because I was talking with someone and I and I was like, "Well, what if we go to you know what if we shoot in the fall?" And they're like, "Nothing's going to open in the fall, you know. And if they are, then you can't have people kissing or you can't have people." You know, there's no extras, right? And then I go, oh, what are the stories going to be when you're, you know, you're rewriting to a, a play, right? Mm. Meaning we're all, you know, six feet apart or, you know, how many meters apart and we have no background. <laughs> so it's not funny, but it's just an odd, odd, um, I don't know, just an odd and very real challenge um, right now. Like it's so present and it's so changing every second. Um, yeah. I don't know what else to say about that. Hmm. Yeah. Um, after, uh, so what I've been working on, uh, I, I just finished an epic uh, 10 favorite albums Facebook challenge. So that was, that took a lot of my time. 
Uh, I'm in a few Twitter arguments over uh, how good or bad or terrible my movie is. So that's also taking a lot of my time. So there's a lot of social media stuff that I'm working on, Jesse. I'm trying to work through my own anxiety. So uh, no, uh, <laughs> so we're, uh, uh, we, Dwayne and I, um, we are, are working on, uh, I, I just mentioned a, a comedy heist film um, that's uh, based in uh, some real life Métis lore. Um, and so we're working on that and the scripts. Uh, so it's as Marie was just saying, you know, like that's something I'm used to doing alone. So that's normal for me. Um, and uh, it's, I would say though, well, it's normal to be alone writing. Um, it's, it took me about, I would say three weeks to adjust to whatever this is like it's mm -hmm. normal but you know my daughter's not at school and that's 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 not cool you know like what are young people going through this is you know and then my own anxiety oh uh, something in the back of my throat what is that you know like well, you know this that uh, that stuff is, is is been sleepless nights and you know reading headlines and the news and and, and I'm, you know, one of the super, super lucky people, obviously, you know, other people and families and nations and communities are going through, you know, hell. And, uh, and then you, you just sort of sitting, what can you do? You know, I can't even send money. I got no income, you know? So it's just, you're just stuck in this weird place, which is hard to find the motivating uh, moments for. Uh, it's easier to get front of mind distraction as opposed to deep place thinking and creating. Um, so, you know, it's not ideal, but it's still possible. So there is a lot of writing and other shows and ideas are being created and there's a, working with different producers creating things to be pitching, to be in development seems like the best place to be right now. So there's quite a lot of that going on, which is great. Um, some productions that were meant to, meant to go to camera this summer obviously are not. Um, you know, one documentary that was going to be on uh, singer songwriter Tom Wilson. Obviously, we can't do it because one of the character mm -hmm. elements is he's a musician who performs. So, let alone the crew, he can't do what he does on camera that makes his world make sense. So, you know, uh, that's another thing that sort of, you know, drama or docs are in this sort of weird holding pattern. On top of that, um, there's other projects where I'm just like, no, I don't think in a post COVID world, whatever that is, whenever that is, that's going to be a story that people are going to want to watch. By the time we can get outside and we can go to camera, is that the next thing that people are going to want to sit and watch? You know, so then, then you got to, I'm trying to think of like, what would I want to see at the end of this? You know, people together, <laughs> you know, personally, per I'm just talking personally. The last thing I want to do is, you know, like Red Rover coming out now is great. You know, Red Rover post COVID is like, no, get out there and join humanity, be with everybody. But there's a related, there's a relatability to Red Rover and the character's quest and of trying to escape and be uh, this feeling of isolation and I want to be alone and how frustrating it is. But, you know, so that it's trying to think of projects in that way too, of like, you know, will this still apply? And so, you know, what do I want to watch mm. when after this is over? Like, you know, comedies, people together overcoming, you know, uh, this opportunity to have unity, you know, uh, that's that's just my, again, my personal lens on and my personal wants and desires and feelings. So those are the things that I'm also trying to put into the equation of what next. So it, it either way, whether it's COVID, a reaction to it literally or poetically, emotionally, in some way, it's impossible not to think what, when we finally do go to camera, what are those things? And potentially how tone deaf will some things be if they don't adjust, if they just remain exactly the way they are and just say, okay, good to go. Let's roll when this thing's lifted. Maybe some things can, other things, I, you know, in my case, a couple of projects, I'm like, that just wouldn't, I don't think it's right. I don't think it's gonna hit right. So um, the fact that it's not happening is great. I wonder, besides your own movies, uh, and maybe you're not watching them, but what are you watching at this moment? Uh, what What is it that, that you're turning to, uh, to occupy the time or, or whatever it may be in this moment? I'd be interested to what the two of you are watching. Hmm. Well, that's a good, okay. I shouldn't say it's a, it's a, like I've just been going through uh, new releases and then I was going, I'm writing in TV more. So I've been watching series and mini series for the form and also to track, you know, the narrative and 
how that works or how I like it or don't like it, all those things. Uh, so I think I've consumed almost everything that I love. And now I'm, in, now I'm in this kind of, um, you know, that spot where you go, oh, I'll just watch it to see. I mean, sometimes I have movies where I go, I just need movies that make me go to sleep. Like I should be watching them, but I know it's, it's called my sleeping movies, right? And so, and then I you won. fall asleep. Yeah, you, you have those too. Everybody has those, right? So it's kind of funny. And then I go, oh, I didn't realize that I, I would never have watched this movie if I wasn't just desperate. And now, and then there's some movies I'm, I'm legitimately surprised. And I go, oh, I really love that. And to be honest, sometimes I'm watching just really bad movies and really bad series. Because so, sometimes that gives me uh, an idea of what, you know, what was promising. What was the promise of the story? Mm -hmm. And then how did it go wrong? Or you're trying to think of mm -hmm. analyze. So, you know, I'd like to, and I watch almost everything. So. Uh, I kind of feel like it's it's really just an opportunity to um, be exposed to stories that you wouldn't necessarily be pulled by. And then you're kind of going, I'm just going to check this out and see, you know, what was excellent and, and what worked and, and then what, you know, try to figure out what went wrong or how mm. did they get to the right. So mm. I'm kind of in that stages. That's me usually right now. Um, that Marie, you sound like a target audience for Red Rover. Like when you're sleepy <laughs> and it. you're looking for crap you to watch, like that's, that's what we're relying on. The, the COVID, there's, is there nothing else on? But oh, here's this new movie. Like that's, uh, thank you. I so thank watched you for... it yesterday and I watched the whole thing. I watched Red Rover and I just, I was just, congratulations. It was beautiful and delicate and I love the performances and, man. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I, I feel the same way about Red Snow, and I was charmed to uh, uh, be on a DGC Director Guild of Canada jury that honored your efforts in that film with a nomination, uh, and deservedly so. So everybody needs to see Red Snow because it's uh, from a master worker in our industry. But I would say, what am I watching uh, to get that out of the way? I have a 13, uh, 12 year old daughter, uh, and so she's getting older every day. And um, we watched Never Have I Ever. Uh, we watched uh, Hashtag Black AF. Uh, we watched sort of family comedies and teen coming of age comedies, uh, which I love. And it's we laugh and we see ourselves in the parents. And, and so we do, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and because of the film that I'm, I'm writing, I'm, I'm into a big nostalgia kind of um, it's set in 1991. So I'm trying to sort of bone up on my early 1990s, late 80s uh, movies. So it's great. We just went through Point Break uh, and uh, Thelma and Louise. And uh, I'm really getting into the look and feel of those, uh, those 90s films. Uh, and of course, the Netflix series, The Last Dance uh, with mm -hmm. Michael Jordan. And that's all about that. I know, right? But it's, I'm mostly, I'm just like, can we just wind back that sequence of the audience? people really dress like that that's amazing <laughs> you know <laughs> like you know like if, so many those, if so many those if somebody characters if you, if a costume designer said here's what i'm thinking i'd be like that's this is not this is not a farcical character uh, you see all like how all of us dressed in the 90s it wasn't so grungy it was yeah. still kind of dated back in the, er, the late 80s mid 80s it's like wow shoulder pads digging that uh so i'm i'm enjoying uh those things it it, it yeah yeah murray i'm Everyone's interested last um, dance. you know when you and i first met you were a playwright oh everyone's watching last dance for sure um but i'm interested murray when you and i first met you were doing theater primarily and um, uh, now you, you, you know, you did the, you've done documentary, feature film, now you're doing series. Can you talk about, and you mentioned having to watch series to sort of get the feel of, of it versus a movie. <clears throat> Can you talk about the process difference? Like how, as a writer, how the approach to theater is different from a film, different from a series? Um, I think the, the gift that theater gave me was um, looking at how to articulate larger ideas and, and, and the idea, the fact that in theater you're working a lot on dialogue because that's how you get your ideas forwarded. And uh, theater very much, playwriting is, 
for me has always been one of the hardest forms. Like it's an evil, evil uh, occupation to be a playwright. It's so delicate and it's so demanding. Not to say that being you know, a writer in film or TV is less, it's just a great grounding to have because it's, um, it, it's a task mass, you know, like it's, it's, you have to have chops and mm. you learn them very, you know, you pay your dues learning them. Um, so I think, you know, the trend, uh, transitioning from that to film took me, it took me a bit because the first time is, uh, is almost like, you know, you're writing, you know, if I'm writing in film, um, I can, when I write in theater, I see theater. Like I see the whole production. When I write in film, the first you know couple took me a, a, a while to lay in. But what it was is it's just like learning another language. You know, I can see it, um, but I sometimes uh, using the wrong word or using the wrong uh, way to express the image. So that took me a while in film, going from say when I did the Unnatural and Accidental Women, which was a play and adapted it to the film Unnatural and Accidental. It was, it was really learning a new language. Um, and that, that story allowed me to do that. Um, kind of transitioning into TV. Um, and I had a long time ago did a, a year on Da Vinci's Inquest uh, mm. in the writing room. And so kind of re-entering re TV again, um, I, I just love the longer narrative. I love miniseries. I love the form because of the, uh, the ability to tell a story um, over a longer time. And, um, and I think because uh, TV and miniseries, it's such a writer's domain. It's a little bit, puts me a little bit back at where theater was, which the writer is kind of held at a certain, um, place in the world uh, and, and, and obviously in TV uh, and miniseries in, in that arena, uh, writers are really held at a certain mark. And I love that because for me, uh, writing, uh, whether it's film or any other kind of medium, um, is, is a very important part of storytelling uh, or the stories I, I choose to tell. So it's dominated by that, that, um, that discipline. Um, so I'm forever like, you know, when I was transitioning from even before I started writing uh, theater, I would read, you know, hundreds of theater scripts. Uh, when I was transitioning into film, I would read a hundred films and then see the films and same with TV. I sometimes read the scripts uh, and watch the scene and just kind of going, well, how was that laid out on the script and how did that get articulated uh, to the film? And what you know, what worked and doesn't work. I'm forever fascinated because it's such a um, collaborative experience. But it's it's very. Uh, I think you have to be very be very succinct in your articulation of it, or mm. you don't. But you know, that's what you're trying to do. But yeah, we've got a couple questions uh, from folks that are uh, watching. So why don't I ask uh, a couple of those? This one comes from Sasha MacArthur. Uh, how did you find the process of getting distribution? Did you self-distribute? And uh, do you still have the rights to your films? Shane wants to take that one off. Uh, so um, one of the, the kind of the, the normal way that films are released uh, is usually some kind of festival <laughs> run to, get, to kick things off. Um, so feature films going to festivals, oftentimes that's where they're sort of meeting their matches and making uh, their connections to either distributor or international sales. Uh, that's where those markets were kind of happening. I don't know what they're replaced with now, to be honest. I mean, I, it, it, sending a screener was not the same as somebody being in a festival where there was a packed room of people that's obviously showing their adoration for your work. So that's if people were motivated to do a deal and to sort of, you know, put it at the front of their catalog, uh, the distributor or sales agent. So I don't know what they're doing now. Um, and then the other model is, you know, sometimes uh, films before they get going, you're selling rights to raise money. So you're making some deals to distributors and sales agents before you even go to camera 
So some of those things are already locked into place. So depends on the project, which way you're starting with them locked into place with only a few regions that are still available for sales or, or the other extreme where Red Rover was for me, which was, it was nobody. It was just myself making a movie and we went to a festival and then we met a distributor based on the response at the festival. And then the, the distributor then works on their international sales agents and other people that they have relationships with to bring the film to market. So that's the, the two extremes. And then there's all, I'm sure a million and one variations in the middle of all those things. You're muted, Jesse, yeah. It wouldn't let me unmute. Um, can you perhaps describe it, Marie, from from your perspective in terms of um, how, how the process of getting distribution for Red Snow? Were they on uh, right away? Like, just walk us through, because um, a lot a lot of folks in our community have okay. never been through this process. So it would be good to hear the other side too. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I think Shane's right. It changes for every project, and um, it, it, I don't think it's ever totally the same. But for Red Snow, we didn't have a distributor on um, out of the gate. So uh, like Shane, we were meeting uh, people, you know, in post, uh, going to festivals and different market initiatives from Telefilm and, and uh, other BC uh, stakeholders. So you go to festivals and you try to set up meetings with distributors that are there. Um, and uh, we met with uh, A71 out of a Whistler Film Festival. And that ended up uh, being Red Snow's um, distributor. And really just find, you know, you're trying to find a partner that loves the film, obviously, um, but also um, has an idea of how to get it to market. Mm -hmm. And of course, in Indigenous world, we're also trying to, in tandem, uh, find distributors that also understand that we're also trying to get our films to Indigenous, you know, screens uh, and audiences. So I think those things are important. and. I think Jesse could probably speak to it. It's, I think it's still a hard, it's a hard game to find, uh, you know, the right partner. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's, I don't know if it's ever easy. I just think the, uh, the industry itself has changed quite a bit. Uh, so I think new models are being found all the time. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can, I, I, I'm not a filmmaker, so I can only speak from my experience on a slightly different side. But I do, you know, know a lot of filmmakers from uh, independents to folks who work for the major studios. None of them find it easy. It's always incredibly difficult. Uh, even when you're making a uh, hundred million dollar movie, you will still find yourself not having all the resources you would imagine. It's just how scale works and all of that. And um, you know, in some ways, I think those of us who live or those that practice below that or well below that can have, well, it can be harder in some ways. Creatively, it can often be more fulfilling, quite frankly, than when you're making huge, big studio projects. You're getting studio notes, which are um, spears that crush and pierce your soul. And, you know, when you're really embedded in the big sort of big economics of this sector, it's really not all that much fun. And if you're an artist, it can be a real, real uh, challenge because you're you are you are much less in control of your actual art than when you are um, uh, closer. One more question. Uh, this is from Janet Marie Rogers. Um, I see the cross genres happening in indigenous arts, i.e., music and literature is also a practice in filmmaking. And in doing so, we create new genres, uh, i.e. new self-defined territories, which represent us in film. Would you guys agree? I agree, Janet. Hi. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the most exciting things about uh, not just the, um, the, the vitality of what our artists are doing, but that we're crossing, we're crossing over. Um, and, I love sometimes that we don't even know that we're doing it. We just believe that it's it's real, you know, like it's a real thing. And I, I think that has a great energy and um, kind of partly why I think uh, people are, audiences are attracted to our films are because of that energy and because they're not expecting that. 
what Marie uh, said. <laughs> well, yeah, that's where you're at, right, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I totally agree. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there was a question, another question here by a, a, a Belcourt, an Alan Belcourt. And oh, he, I don't here know we if, go. Are they a relation? I don't know, Shane. Um, it says, hello, Mr. Belcourt. Wow. Well, this has already gone way off the rails. Um, hello, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Exactly. Belcourt. I had a question. How, I'm an, uh, how do can I find an established producer? I'm an actor and writer, and I'm looking to film a pilot. Uh, okay. Well, initially, by addressing your question to Mr. Belcourt, you may mean my dad, Tony <laughs> Belcourt. Uh, that's how I. Uh, but Shane. Um, so uh, yeah, no. I mean, it's it, it is. Um, how to break in in a more general kind of, you know, question, you know, specifically how to get a pilot, you know, there's a whole TV thing there, but, um, you know, it's the transition from being a writer or someone who's an actor who does writing also uh, into, you know, getting your project realized. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's an understatement to say that it's very difficult and it's always a long journey and the relationships are, are really what it's about. Um, uh, I can say for myself and um, in my own career that I was somebody when way, way back when you had Final Cut 7 and a mini DV camera, I was like, yes, you can make movies at home. Like I have <laughs> access to the means of production. We can do this. Uh, and obviously now even an iPhone 11 Pro, whatever, you can shoot your sizzle reels for your pro projects. You can, you know, do these things with all that, you know, on your phones now with all this great technology, you can really start realizing some ideas and starting to experiment with, with the form of filmmaking. But it's still, with that said, it still is about relationships. It's, a rela it's an industry that is so much about, you know, who you know um, and who knows you. It sounds sort of transactional and it doesn't have to be. It really is about who you have a relationship with, who, what community will speak with you or for you and help you and, uh, and, and be a part of your, your journey as an artist. So I would encourage you, Mr. Belcourt, um, to uh, you know, go to festivals, uh, to go to uh, theater, um, you know, community things that you can get into because the, that peer group is ultimately the people that will hold you. In my own experience, it was at Imaginative. I was just a dude who had a mini DV camera and I made a little silly short and I submitted it to Imaginative. I went to Imaginative Film Festival here in Toronto. I am definitely in one sense lucky. You could say unlucky, it depends on where to look at that, that I live in Toronto. So it was easy for me to go to the festival. Um, hopefully there's a grant or something that can allow you to get to the festival if you live outside the city. Uh, and then that's where I met people. I met people that I, I know to this day and work with to this day and have relationships to this day. And it's just from going and loving movies, loving our community and what we're trying to do and participating as much as I could with all, with those things. And that's how you do it. And then that's so specifically how to get a pilot into a producer. Um, it's, you know, there's too many variables there, you know, to send a blind pilot to a producer can be really hard. They might not want to read it because they may have something similar. They don't want to get sued. There's all this kind of stuff. So I would say start with relationships, target relationships, build those relationships, watch what people are doing. If someone's doing something that you think is akin to the kind of vibe that you want to do, seek out those people. You follow them on Twitter, for, get a conversation. You'd be amazed uh, how open the community is uh, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, two great storytellers and people that respect their own time. I think that's uh, great advice, uh, Shane. I'm just going to read, as we're, we're going to wrap up here, I'm just going to read this from uh, Do the great Dorothy Christian, who I will uh, advise. She is a, a board member of the Indigenous Screen Office, but an, an auntie to all of us. She says, Indigenous knowledge by its very nature is interdisciplinary which is why our art artistic expressions are so layered and emotionally magnificent. And I could not agree more with, uh, with Dorothy. Um, let's remind folks where they can see your movies. I think Red Snow comes out tomorrow, everybody, on iTunes. So tomorrow, pre-order. You can probably pre-order it right now. Go do that. Uh, rent it, buy it, do all that good stuff. Uh, tell, Get it for a friend, gift it. 
all that stuff. Red Snow tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, get it on uh, iTunes. And then uh, Shane, uh, they can find Red Rover, I believe from what I remember, virtually anywhere a screen exists. Yes, okay. any platform that has movies on it, Red Rover's on it. So look for your iTunes, whatever it is, it's there. Thank you both so very much uh, for joining me. I, I think this worked out great. Uh, hopefully those uh, who were watching got a lot out of it. And folks, uh, we hope to do more of this at the Indigenous Screen Office. And um, yes, thank you both to Shane and Marie. Watch their movies and we'll see you soon. Thank you guys.